Hey friends, my name is Cody Brazelton and I'm one of the leaders here at our Ark Valley campus located inside the Arkansas Valley Correctional Facility in Ordway, Colorado. I am so glad that you're choosing to join us online today and I pray that your time spent in worship and learning from God's word is encouraging. Here at our Ark Valley campus, one of the things we really value is community. Without healthy relationships and other guys around us encouraging us, pointing us to Jesus, and walking alongside us, it's easy to be isolated and get discouraged. That's why community groups are such a priority. At Woodman, we believe that God wired us to thrive in community. We need deep, long-lasting friendships that will help us walk through hard seasons, celebrate milestones, and challenge us to grow in our walk with Jesus. If you're nodding your head like, yeah, I do want something like that, then you'll find community groups to be a great way to find that deeper connection. We see lives being transformed as people connect and grow. You can join a group that meets in a home or in your part of town on a weeknight. They're the perfect place for imperfect people to build relationships and encourage one another to become more like Christ. To find out more about community groups or to find a group that you can plug into, visit the website. Or you can plan to join your local Woodman campus for an in-person service and stop by Connect Central after service. Whether it's your first time checking out Woodman, you're out of town and staying connected, or you've been viewing online for a while, we are so glad that you are worshiping with us today. As a church, our mission is to love well and change lives through Christ. This vision leads us to serve and share the hope of Jesus in our neighborhoods and beyond. In every worship service, we celebrate who God is and what he's doing in and through his people. And at the same time, we head into the week inspired and encouraged to live for him in the week ahead. Let's focus our hearts and get ready to join the time of worship in just a few moments. Well, good morning. Happy Sunday, though it may not be so happy after my Jets beat your Broncos. Come on, come on. Uh, my name is Micah. If we have not yet gotten the chance to meet, I serve on our Woodman students team. And man, I would love the chance to meet you. Um, we are so excited to see what God is going to do in our weekend service this weekend. Man, we trust that when we gather in fellowship with other believers, when we lift high the name of Jesus and worship him through songs of praise and, and open up his word together, we trust that he will meet us and move in powerful ways. And so again, we're excited and expectant to see what God is going to do this morning. Um, if this is your first time coming to Woodman or you've been here for a long time but just have not yet found a spot to get plugged in and connected, I want to invite you after the service to check out Connect Central. If you head out these center doors and turn left, on your right-hand side, you'll be greeted by a team of people equipped, eager, and ready to give you all the info and find the right fit for you to get plugged in, whether that's a community group, a Woodman U course, or a Connect group. We are really excited as a church about our Connect Groups. This is a way for you to get plugged in with other people around interest-based groups. It could be a hiking group, a running group. Um, those are the exercise ones. We don't all like doing that. Um, but, but they're interest-based groups. And so if you're looking to get plugged in with people who, who share a hobby or maybe a similar life stage, I would encourage you to check out those Connect groups. You can find more about those Connect groups on our weekend online service guide which you can access through scanning that QR code on the pew back in front of you or by going on our Woodman app. And so I would encourage you, I know it's rare probably to be told to like bring out your phone in church, but if you don't have the Woodman app, I would encourage you to download it right now 
On there, you can access the, the, the weekend service guide and get more info for Connect Groups and find Bible reading plans, articles to keep you updated with what Woodman is doing in our community and our world. And so I would just encourage you um, to download the Woodman app. I mean, we place such a high value on connecting with others uh, through connect groups, community groups here at Woodman. Um, but this morning, as we engage in our weekend service, we get a special chance to connect with our Heavenly Father. Right, right, our God that loves us so much that He sent His Son Jesus to die in our place. And so I want to encourage you to stand with me as we get to worship our Almighty God and loving Creator.
praise His
Church, his mercy is more, and it's meeting us in all of our stories. His faithfulness is more, and as we continue to, in this time of worship, if you would turn with me to the, str- the screen, we want to pray a prayer out together. Um, so let's read this out. Jesus, we love, we praise you for your mercy that is new every morning. You are faithful and just to forgive our sins. And you cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We pause for a moment now to confess our sins. Jesus, we thank you that you bore our sins on the cross, that our punishment was laid on your shoulders, and because of your wounds, we have been healed. We rejoice in faith that our eternity is with you. We worship you, and we thank you for your love poured out on the cross. Amen. Church, let's continue to worship. perfect son of God in all his innocence you're walking in the dirt with you and me he knows what living is he's acquainted with our grief a man of sorrow a son of suffering blood and
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for dying in my place, for dying the death that I deserved, that I still deserve. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory, of the glory of God Almighty. But you, Jesus, perfect and blameless and spotless, were the sacrificial lamb in our place. And there was nothing that could cleanse us, nothing that could bring forgiveness or righteousness but your blood. And so we confess again today that we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that Jesus Christ was that perfect sacrifice in our place, and that there is nothing, there is nothing in heaven or on earth that can bring us to the living God but that blood and faith in it. And so Lord, we pray that you would teach us today more about who you are and who we are in you, the truth from your word. We give you our worship, our praise, and as we prepare to bring our tithes and our offerings into the house of the living God, we do so with joy and with gratitude for all you've done for us. Would you use these to glorify the name, the one and only name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Church, you can take a seat. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. So Saul removed him from his presence and made him a commander of the thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David had success in all his undertakings, for the Lord was with him. And when Saul saw that he had great success, he stood in fearful awe of him. and wondering why people are clapping. It's, it's because uh, this is the first time uh, ever that I am speaking live at our Southwest campus. Um, all of the technological gremlins that historically have been tripping us up are a thing of the past. And it is so good to be with you uh, to bring the rest of our church in to worship with you and um, grateful for how God is using you. And we are looking forward to how he's going to continue to work in and through you in the months and years ahead. Well, last uh, Sunday was the first day of fall. And I'll tell you, on Sunday, I, I believed it. I had to go up to our monument campus in the evening. And I mean, it was, it was pitch black, but not, not even that late. There, there was some scattered clouds. My car told me it was 44 degrees out. And I know this sounds strange, but maybe a couple of you can relate. It, it smelled cold. <laughs> but then Monday came and summer with Moxie just fought back, didn't she? I mean, this week has been beautiful along the front range. Now, you are probably at this point being, so you come to Southwest and now you're talking about the weather. Well, here, here's the thing. It's because this past week, in a way, reminded me of our passage this morning. Uh, David had been anointed the next king of Israel. He, he has slayed Goliath. And as we're going to see in the text, he has ongoing success. Might say he is him. But Saul, the current king, he's having trouble accepting it. And as someone who does prefer warmer weather, I'm, I'm happy that summer's fighting back. But what I 
and, and all of my pumpkin sweater loving brothers and sisters know, <laughs> un unless there's a miracle, autumn's coming. I mean, where we live, it is just a matter of time. And there's nothing any of us can do to stop it. How things could have been different for Saul had he just come to a similar realization. You know, 1 Peter 5, 6 says to humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you. One wonders how Saul's life could have been different had he heard those words before. One wonders how our lives need to be different because we have. In a day and age with so many people who are just fighting for their rights, there is something so refreshing in a gospel that says we can let it all go. I want to pray that God gives us ears to hear what he wants to say. Heavenly Father, I thank you uh, for the changing seasons. I, I do personally wish summer was longer, but I, I thank you for the way we see the consistency in your created order. I pray it serves as a reminder for all of us uh, that even though winter may seem long, spring does come. And even though we may be waiting on you for what seems like an eternity, eternity will one day come and you will fulfill every promise you ever made to us. Help us this day to be attentive, to, to listen. Would you help me not to make any mistakes? Thank you for the opportunity to be at our Southwest campus. Be glorified in our midst this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you have a Bible, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And we're going to pick it up at verse 54. As I said, David had just defeated Goliath. Uh, the Israelites had plundered the Philistine camp. And our passage, it, it's not really complex. Uh, the narrator is, is just wanting to forward the narrative along. And it's important to remember, he's not looking to teach on particular subjects. He's looking to tell us what actually happened. Though as we work through the narrative, there are some things we're going to deal with. We see, we see the issue of friendship come up. Uh, we see how jealousy wreaks havoc. Uh, we see God's providential control. And we see Saul's stubbornness. My guess is, with that kind of range, there might be something for everyone. It begins with David receiving some warranted recognition. And it, it involves a, a little bit of a flashback. Look at verse 54. It says, And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. Now, from a, like a biblical like splitting up thing, that probably would have gone better with last weekend's passage. But I just got a personal rule, like when preaching, if able, to not end on a severed head. It's just, it's just the kind of thing I do. Like, it just sends people out with the wrong message. So just kind of bumped it to this weekend. Obviously, at the end of the battle, David had a severed head, and he had Goliath's armor. For some reason, we're not told why, he brought the severed head at some point to Jerusalem. Uh, before he did that, he, he took Goliath's armor back to his tent. But then the author does this flashback. And it's a double flashback. He's going to go back to when David was marching out towards Goliath. And then he does like another one to right after the battle. We see it in verse 55. As soon as Saul saw David go out against the Philistines, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, as, as your soul lives, O king, I, I don't know. And the king said, inquire whose son the boy is. And as soon as David returned from striking down of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? 
And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Now, now some people look at this and, and biblical commentators and just people reading it, like get, get a little amped up. Because on, on first blush, it is a little bit of a head scratcher. We know as the readers that David had already been serving in, in Saul's court. And so it sounds a little bit like, even though he'd been serving, rocking the tunes, that now Saul doesn't know who he is. And so they're like, maybe chapter 16 was supposed to come after 17. May, I, don't, I don't really know. Well, to be clear, Saul isn't saying that he doesn't know who David is. If you look at the text, what he's saying is, who's his dad? And, and, and maybe as Goliath, as Goliath is standing there and, and Saul watches the little shepherd guy walk out, maybe he's like, we, we got to find out who this guy's dad is because I'm going to need to send the we regret to inform you telegram. And then it changes when, when David comes back with a severed head. Saul knows that part of his offer was to be free of state and federal taxes forever. And so he's like, I, I got to send your dad some good news. Who is he? Saul knew who David was, but Saul knew a lot of people. He didn't remember his, his family, which I think is normal. You know, I find that a lot in our, in our home. Like my sons, they, 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 have, they have friends and I'm, I try, but like I know names, I know stuff, but sometimes I'm like, wait, is that Woodman kid, school kid, both kid? Is that, is that the guy on the team? Is that the guy here? Saul knew David, but he, but he couldn't remember his dad. What happens next though, is you see that David's family would never be forgotten ever again. He received some warranted recognition. Verse one of chapter 18 says, as soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him, so that the people set him, so that Saul set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Though we're not told it in chapter 17, turns out that Jonathan had been present for the entire battle and observed the whole thing. And Jonathan, Saul's son, was the guy who at one point was willing to storm a Philistine camp on his own. But even Jonathan, as mighty a warrior as he was, even he was scared to step to Goliath. But after it's all done, seeing David there holding Goliath's head in his hand, Jonathan's soul is knit to this guy. Jonathan's like, this is the kind of guy I want to be friends with. Have you ever met someone like that? We're not told what it was, but, but, but Jonathan made a covenant with David that day. The details of which are not spelled out. But I, but I got to imagine, it, it was maybe something like, dude, you rock. Seriously, when you were walking out there, <laughs> your little shepherd outfit, and he was in your, I was like, this guy's for sure dead. But, but you're not. And I want to tell you, if you ever are going to fight again, I am going to be in your corner. Never again am I going to be standing in the back. I will be right beside you. You are the man. Jonathan recognized Something special in David. And secure as Jonathan was in his own manhood, he had no problem affirming what he saw in David. It says he took off his robe and he gave it to David. Gave him his sword, his bow, and his belt. I say, what was the significance of that? Well, we're not told exactly. 
But I think a little bit, maybe like at the end of the Super Bowl, you know, when, when the confetti's flying and, and, and the, the winning team gets the hat and the shirt pretty fast, I think Jonathan's like, bro, you can't be in this little shepherd. You put this on. You just killed the life. You might as well look the part. Take my sword. No, take it. We got to get a picture. Now, what it wasn't, I don't think, some think that like Jonathan was like giving up his, his position as heir to the throne. There's just nothing in the text that would say Jonathan has connected those dots yet. Still a cool thing for him to do, but, but I don't think he meant that. The second thing that sometimes gets bantered about, uh, but, but Jonathan is not communicating any, any sort of homosexual attraction to David. Now, the word love um, is used in different ways, right? And it's kind of funny, in Greek, actually, there are different words for different kinds of love. And, and, and so it's, it's really simple to look at the word they're using and be like, oh, that's the kind of love they're talking about. In Hebrew, they, they, they have far fewer words. And so you got to look at the context to, to understand the kind of love that's being described. I love my wife, the Green Bay Packers, and pizza. But you would say, probably not all in the same way. And so we got to look here and understand, well, what, what's the way it's being used here? And there's nothing sexual about this. It is cool, though, especially for some of us, you know, stiff upper lip kind of guys, to be men that can say, like, I love that dude. To, to be able to say, I'm, I'm with you through thick and thin. What we're going to see is in the text, like everybody loves David, except for Saul. What happened next, though, is Saul brought him on full time. So we know from last weekend, right, that there had been that age requirement. He had to be 20. David wasn't. But after killing Goliath, he's like, we're going to waive that. You're in. And then he set him over the men of war. And David was successful in multiple battles. And I think it's a good little point to dwell on for just a second. It says that he was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. No shock that the people would be like, that guy's awesome. Kind of special that Saul's servants thought it too. Because, you know, sometimes the people who are working alongside you aren't always as happy for your success. Could imagine like some servant, I was just about to go out there and kill, I was going to do it myself. I was just getting my stuff. (laughs) But no, even the ones working close in, they were like, that guy's legit. (laughs) Now that David received all this recognition is really not all that unexpected. But that Jonathan was so upfront with his feelings on the subject, especially being a dude, that, that's special and totally opposite of how Jonathan's father, Saul, will respond. And I don't want to ruin this story for those of you who have not read ahead. But whatever it was that Jonathan committed to on that day, he meant every single word. In time, Jonathan will risk his position as heir to the throne and Jonathan will risk his very life to protect David. All of us would be very fortunate to have a Jonathan in our lives. And some of us don't even need people who are willing to die for us. We would just love to have a friend. I wonder if you need one. It's why we have connect groups. We talked about it at the beginning of the service, but I happen to know that not everybody was here yet. (laughs) Connect groups are just an opportunity for you to meet. Well, that's awkward. (laughs) Connect groups are just an opportunity for for you to meet other people. And, and, And we do them for the simple fact that everybody needs somebody sometime. And even if you're like, no, I'm good. Make no mistake about it. Jonathan was good. He was a mighty warrior in his own right. He was, he was the son of the king. 
and the presumptive heir to the throne of Israel. Dude was secure and had a lot of things going for him. And he had no problem saying, bro, I am with you. Do you need to do that? Do you have your people? If you don't know the story, this is where things really begin to turn south. And had Saul been more like Jonathan, or had Saul been more like the girl in Frozen who could let everything go, the, the story would be different. But, but, but Saul can't do it. He can't let it go. And, and, and he, he becomes blatantly jealous. Look at verse 6. It says, as they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated, Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. <clears throat> and Saul was very angry, and this saying displeased him. He said, they've ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they've ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day on. Remember that in the Israelite army back then, women did not serve. And so often, with good precedent, when the army would return, particularly victoriously, the women would celebrate their arrival. And it goes kind of back, but Miriam, Moses' sister, when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, she got together with some of the gals and they wrote a song to celebrate what God had done. So not surprisingly, huge victory, the women do the same thing. They write a song to celebrate what God had done. And we only have one line from the song, and it's the line that bothered Saul. There were other lines in the tune, but this is the only one that got kept. And it bothered Saul, because it said that he'd killed his thousand and David had killed his ten thousands. What's well, a little, ins- want to be nice to Saul, but if he'd spent a little more time in the word, he, he would have known that was kind of like a, like a, a, normal, a, a normal literary thing they used. In Deuteronomy like 32, I think it was, it talked about one set a thousand to flight and two set 10,000. It, it, it wasn't trying to say, hey, these two did a better job than this guy. It was actually just saying, we set a lot of people to flight. Uh, the ladies could have easily said it the other way. They weren't trying to communicate that David was better than Saul. They were trying to say Saul and David killed a lot of people. And even at the end of the day, who does the text say explicitly the women went out to greet? It says they went out to greet Saul. They weren't like, oh, here's our chance. We'll take our dig at that king. No, they were like, this is amazing. You guys went out there. We thought you'd all be dead, but you're coming back. David, Saul, you guys rock. But Saul, he didn't take it that way. It says, Saul eyed David from that day on. And what's kind of wild is the word for eyed there in Hebrew rhymes with their word for iniquity. So already it kind of takes this kind of brooding, dark turn where you're like, something's afoot. Verse 10 says, the next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul. He's having a bad week. And he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre, as he did day by day. And Saul had his spear in his hand. And Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. I mean, this is as crazy as it sounds. We have an evil spirit from the Lord. We're not going to go into it. You can go back a couple of weeks and listen when we address that, right? But, but Saul's raving, and, and he's raving in his house with a spear in his hand. And you have to imagine there was some servant that was kind of like, you should, we should probably get the spear. And the guy's like, you go get the spear. Well, I was thinking that you would do it. I'm not getting the spear. Well, we, someone needs to get the spear. Like, he's raving. But what's wild is he's armed with his spear. David's just rocking his little axe, totally unarmed. And Saul's like, that's it. I'm going to kill this kid. 
And he winds up and he throws the spear. And David evades him. And what I love is that, like in my little worldview, if you throw a spear at me, I'm just leaving the room then. <laughs> I'm out, right? It says that Saul tried twice. It's like David was just like, now Saul, no. No. And, and, and because it's a spear, Saul's walking to get the spear out of the wall. And David's like, Saul, Saul, no. And he tries to kill him twice. And it says, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Now, it's a little bit of a geek point, and I wanna, don't want to push it, but like, it doesn't really say that Saul recognized that God was with him, but it says that Saul was afraid because the Lord was with him. Even in his raving stand, Saul was like, I'm, it's not my first rodeo. I've killed people with a spear before. How did I not be, how could I not kill this guy at close quarters? What's going on with this kid? Verse 13 says, So Saul removed him from his presence and made him a commander of a thousand. And he went and came in before the people, and David had success in all his undertakings, for the Lord was with him. And when Saul saw that he had great success, he stood in fearful awe of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, for he went and came in before them. In a weird way, I I do feel a little bit sorry for Saul because the the guy can't catch a break. He's afraid of David. David's killed Goliath. David had been in charge. And and now most commentators are saying David's been demoted. He's gone from being over the guys to now over a thousand, which has now placed him back on the battlefield full time. But David doesn't die. David just keeps on winning. And Saul, Saul stood in fearful awe of this guy. And and all the people, Israel and Judah, loved him. Uh, Jealousy, I'm telling you, never, it never ends anywhere good. A jealousy really is a useless emotion. A jealousy is the appendix of the emotional spectrum. We, we are happy to have it at times, but we could do without. And, and this isn't like technical, but in the world according to Pastor Josh, there are kind of three types of jealousy. There is good jealousy. God is jealous for us. It's good. You should be jealous of, of your spouse. That's, that's good. But then there's bad jealousy. It's the jealousy that just, just comes from seeing someone have something you don't and you want it. Your neighbor has a better car. Your neighbor has a nicer stand of grass. She's taller. And, and, and we, we can get jealous. But actually, the worst kind of jealousy, maybe, I think, is what Saul's demonstrating here. Because Saul's actually sinning and jealous of someone who's not. And Saul could have solved his jealousy by just admitting he was wrong. But he doesn't. I wonder if you need to. And to be sure, right, the author didn't, I want to kind of like teach on jealousy today, so how could I weave that in? No, he's, he's just telling us the story. But we see in this story, jealousy is going to play a profound part. And if you're jealous of someone, would Saul's example maybe encourage you to get in front of that quick? Saul goes the other direction, having tried to kill him personally, Now he's going to see if he can have others do it. And he just begins this murderous plotting. Verse 17. Then Saul said to David, Here is my elder daughter, Merab. I will give her to you for a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, let not my hand be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. And David said to Saul, Who am I? And who are my relatives, my father's clan in Israel, that I should be son-in-law to the king? But 
At the time when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, she was given to Adriel, the Maholophite, for a wife. Now, there are some questions that we can't really have the answers to, but, but generally, the, the narrative is, is, is pretty clear. It has a little bit of a bait and switch vibe, right? Saul had said, whoever kills Goliath, I'm going to give one of my daughters as a wife. But now it does sound a little bit like he switched it, right? I'm going to give you me rap, only be valiant for me and, and the Lord. Like, I'll give her to you, but now you have to keep fighting. Which what Saul had said on the day when Goliath was standing there gave you the sense that, no, I could actually just take the wife and I'm retiring now. But, but, but we're told Saul's motive, right? He's like, I'm going to give you the wife, but I want you to keep fighting because he's like, you know what? I'll let the Philistines kill him. I, I've, had, I've, had a, I've tried. It hasn't worked. So Dave, here you go. You can have her. Just keep fighting, and I'm going to solve my problems. What he wasn't expecting was David kind of doing, and I'm not saying he didn't mean it legitimately, but like, hey, who am I, man? You're a king. My clan's small. I'm from Bethlehem. You didn't even remember my dad. I, I mean, I can't really have her. And, and, and it seems like it skips some stuff, but I think it's kind of instructive that the author puts in, but at the time when David should have gotten Mirab, Saul gave her to someone else. So it, it just, it sounds like things aren't going awesome. It sounds like Saul didn't live up to his side of the bargain, but he has another chance. Verse 20. Now Saul's daughter, Michael, loved David. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. And Saul thought, let me give her to him that she may be a snare for him and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore, Saul said to David a second time, you shall now be my son-in-law. And Saul commanded his servants, speak to David in private and say, behold, the king is to lighten you and all his servants love you. Now then become the king's son-in-law. And Saul's servants spoke these words in the ears of David. And David said, does it seem to you a little thing to become the king's son-in-law? Since I am a poor man and have no reputation. It's no real surprise. I think if we were to walk up and down the streets of Jerusalem and go into the homes, a lot of teenage girls would have had posters of David up in the wall. You know, like he was, he killed Goliath. The kid was good looking. He played instruments, skinny jeans. I mean, obviously. <laughs> And now here's Michael, Saul's daughter, who loves him. And instead of being like, here's my baby girl who's in love with this hero, Saul's like, oh, this is perfect. I can use this. He, he actively offers up Michael to the man that she loves, hoping that, that he can get, her, get, get, get him killed. And he uses his servants to work behind the scenes. David again reports being unworthy, though now he starts actually specifying a little bit. Uh, he says, I'm a poor man. And what he's getting at is like, I, I really can't afford the bride price for, for a regular girl. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't have the kind of cash for a princess. And Saul is going to solve it albeit somewhat gruesomely, verse 24. And the servants of Saul told him, thus and so did David speak. Then Saul said, thus shall you say to David, the king desires no bride price except a hundred foreskins of the Philistines that he may be avenged on the king's enemies. Now Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. And when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law. And before the time it expired, David arose and went along with his men and killed 200 of the Philistines. And David brought their foreskins, which were given in full number to the king, that he might become the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him his daughter, Michael, for a wife. Saul just wants David dead. And so when David says, oh, I can't take her, I can't afford it, Saul's like, oh, no, I, I, well, I got, I got something you could do instead. Go, go, and, go and get me 100 Philistine foreskins. And so the thing about that is it's not necessarily occurring in regular battle, right? There was a time limit on it. And Saul's kind of thinking, there's a strong chance this guy doesn't live through this, right? Because David's going to show up and be like, hey, guys, I'm going to need something, and we're all here to get it. And he takes out not just the hundred, but
but 200 of them. And again, just as the author didn't set out to teach on jealousy, but we see it, so too you don't get the sense that he really set out to teach on God's providential control. But you got to admit, God is looking after David here. We, the readers, know what Saul was beginning, I think, to really clue into. But we, the readers, know that God had said that David would be the next king. And while I don't think that led David to be flippant or or to take unusual risk, I, I don't think he had put it into those kinds of terms in his head. We, the reader, know. David's going to be the next king. And so Saul, you can send him out to battle after battle after battle, but because God has promised that's going to be the next king, we know that kid's coming home because he's going to sit on your throne. Now, how long he lives after that, we can't say for sure, but we know he's making it at least that far. And why? Because God said it. Which means it wasn't as risky a step as it probably felt to David. It also means that you and I should take God at his word too. You struggle with that? You know, like as the preacher, you want to come to your point of application. There's literally like hundreds, thousands, thousands promises to highlight. But I kind of wondered if just to focus on John chapter 14 when Jesus said, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would not I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. I mean, that promise alone should change everything about you and I, the way we face this afternoon, tomorrow, the months, the years that we got. Right? No matter what happens between today and the day when we go into eternity, we know on the day we go into eternity, at some point, I don't know what the check-in procedure's like, but at some point, Jesus is going to take you to a place and he's going to say, I've been, I've been working on this for you. It's a fact. No matter, no, no, no matter what befalls you between now and then, you and I have a place that we are headed If you are in Christ, he has started working on your room. And it will be ready for you when you get there. Do you need to remember that? Saul. Saul could have done himself a ton of favors. But he he had a stubborn heart. Verse 28 says, but when Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. Saul was even more afraid of David. So Saul was David's enemy continually. Then the commanders of the Philistines came out to battle, and as often as they came out, David had more success than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was highly esteemed. As we've seen... If you've been with us, right, Saul was a lot of things, but the man wasn't dumb. And, and he began to connect the dots. And he's like, the, 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 the guy killed Goliath, which I didn't expect. He, he won't die during regular battles. I tried to kill him twice, couldn't do it. And then he goes out and fights some more and keeps coming back. And even when I send him on the gruesome mission, He just comes back more successful. And now I have another problem. My daughter loves him. And I've just made this guy a part of my family. My daughter loves him. My son loves him. The people love him. And now it explicitly says... Saul knew that God was with David. And what's tragic is Saul didn't care. 
he recognized what was going on, but he was too stubborn to admit it. And I do wonder, across these five campuses, how many of us are doing the same thing. Not towards David, but towards his descendant, Jesus. For sure, with as many people who gather in our church on a Sunday morning, or who are watching on the live stream, right? There's some of you who maybe, this is like the first time, the second time. Maybe you grew up in church, you kind of remember some stuff, but you actually are, are, are trying to learn. Like, you don't know what you think because you haven't had much content given you to think about. And that's awesome. We're glad you're here. But I have to imagine there are some of us, it's not a content issue. You're just being so dang stubborn. You've heard that Jesus, the Son of God, put on flesh and he came down to this earth and lived a sinless life on your behalf. You know, you've been told that Jesus was crucified for your sin, buried and rose again from the grave. And you understand what is expected of you. That you need to confess him as Lord, believe that God raised him from the dead, acknowledge your sin, and ask him for his forgiveness. It's not a content issue. You just won't do it. Things could have ended up different for Saul. Had he in humility been like, you know what? I stand down. David, you're the guy. I messed up. Why don't you step up? And I don't know how that story would go. But I can tell you for an absolute fact that if you were to stand down this day and confess Christ as Lord, the rest of your story is dramatically different in ways that you could never ask, think, or imagine for your eternity would be secure. You will one day see your place and every day between now and then will be different because of Christ. Are you just being stubborn? And is this the day you bend your knee? Let me pray. Our God and Father, Lord, we work through these stories and and we know they're recorded for our instruction and we know that they're recorded that we can learn from them. And maybe some of us need a friend. We need a Jonathan. We need to be a Jonathan. Uh, Maybe some of us, uh, we, we need to deal with some jealousy towards someone. We need to let something go. Maybe we need to trust in your providential control. Maybe things aren't going so hot. We need to be reminded that you you are the sovereign. Most timely, perhaps, though, would be if we were being stubborn. Would this be the day that people listening to me would humble themselves under the mighty hand of God? Would they confess Your son is Lord. Believe that you raised him from the dead. And in acknowledging their sin, would you give them new life? Father, we pray, we learn from these stories. Help us do that in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, church, we're gonna take some time to respond. And just want to invite you to respond how you need to, um, to the Lord today. So if that means staying seated and praying, putting yourself in a posture of surrender, we welcome you to do that. Or if you'd like to stand with us and sing, we invite you to do that as well as we close with this last song.
Oh, come behold the works of God, the nations at his feet. He breaks the bow and bends the spear and tells the wars to cease. Oh, mighty one of Israel, you are on our side. We walk by faith in God who burns the chariots with such a strong contrast between David who knows that God is in control and submits to God's authority and then Saul who also knows that God is in control but he grabs at every opportunity he can to try and seize control.
control. We see that in all these little schemes that he comes up with to get the upper hand. And, and I, I know, I think it's pretty clear to all of us which of those two we should be trying to follow. Which of those two between David and Saul we want to emulate and follow as Christians. Um, but if I'm being honest and I take a close look at my own life, man, I see moments, situations where I trend the wrong way, where I want control as well. And I'm willing to bet that I'm not the only person in this room that can say that. And so my prayer as we leave is that all of us would get better and better at submitting to God's authority. That all of us would someday be able to, like Jesus, wholeheartedly say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. If there is anything that we can do for you, any way that we can pray for you, pray with you, we're gonna have pastors and leaders up front who would love the opportunity to do so. We'd be honored. Maybe you need to grab the people around you. If the Lord is nudging at your heart to confess sin or ask for prayer from family, friends, maybe even a pew neighbor, I would also invite you to do that. But as we conclude our service, receive this word of benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Thank you.